Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. My name is Martin Kölling. I'm East Asia correspondent with Handelsblatt, a German financial newspaper, and I'm the co-chair of the Professional Activities Committee. And it is my honor to welcome our guest, Ambassador Catherine Tai, here at the, to speak at the Foreign Correspondents Club. I will keep my introduction very short because I think she has a very limited amount of time and you have many questions. So uh, I would like to open the floor to her without further, any further ado. And uh, yeah, she has a pre short prepared statement and then I will take questions from the floor on, from online or online uh, audience. Wonderful, thank you so much Martin uh, for that introduction. Hello everyone, thank you for having me here today. It's always great to be back in Tokyo. This is actually my fourth trip here as the United States Trade Representative. It speaks to the significance of the US-Japan trade and economic relationship, not just for our two countries, but also for the Asia Pacific region and beyond. This has been a very productive trip. I've met with Minister Nishimura, Minister Hayashi, and others to discuss how we can work even more closely together in the months ahead, including on the Indo-Pacific economic framework. Yesterday, I also enjoyed a visit to the Patagonia store in Shibuya, where I learned more about how the company is fighting back against the use of forced labor in its supply chains, which is an important priority for the United States. Since the start of the Biden-Harris administration, our two governments have worked tirelessly to strengthen and to deepen our bilateral relationship. Our work to form the U.S.-Japan Partnership on Trade in November 2021 provided us with a valuable structure to convene regular dialogue on important trade issues. And since then, we have been able to deliver tangible results for our workers, our small businesses, and our producers on both sides of the Pacific. In March 2022, we reached an agreement to increase the beef safeguard trigger level under the partnership. The agreement came into force on January 1 of this year, and it will allow US exporters to meet Japan's growing demand for high quality beef. We are also working closely together on energy trade. Following extensive consultations that involved USTR, the US Department of Agriculture, and the US Embassy here in Tokyo, the government of Japan announced a new biofuels policy that will allow the United States to export more ethanol to Japan. This is a tremendous step toward a clean energy future that we are taking together. These are important achievements, but our bilateral trade relationship goes much further than trade and goods. We are collaborating on emerging challenges to shape a better future for our people. Let me give you a couple examples. We have all experienced the fragility of our dispersed supply chains in recent years, especially through the pandemic and Russia's brutal, unjustified attack on Ukraine. And we've become too reliant, we have discovered, on certain countries for the supply of critical minerals needed to fuel our clean energy future. So we worked with Japan to negotiate a critical minerals agreement to bolster our collective resilience and security. The agreement covers a number of issues to reinforce supply chains, like commitments on export duties, non-market policies, best practices on investment screening, and also labor rights. It also identifies areas for cooperation and promotes sustainability and transparency across EV battery supply chains. I was pleased to sign the agreement in Washington with Ambassador Tomita. President Biden believes strongly that we can accomplish great things for our people when we work with our allies and partners, and we are doing exactly that. This type of teamwork also applies to the task force we created to promote human rights and eliminate forced labor in global supply chains. We launched the task force in January under the U.S.-Japan Partnership on Trade, and our teams have been meeting regularly to address this important issue. Finally, Japan has been a critical partner in our efforts to advance the Indo-Pacific economic framework. And my meetings here in Tokyo have focused extensively on this initiative. 
In addition to meetings with government representatives, I met with several professors and think tank representatives this morning, and we talked about how we can use the framework to lift up all of our people throughout this region. Since we launched the IPEF here in Tokyo less than a year ago, that was May 2022, we have made very good progress in negotiating across a number of areas that will deliver tangible results to our workers and our businesses, including on trade facilitation, customs, and good regulatory practices. We are also pursuing high standard commitments with regard to labor, the environment, and digital trade, because we believe that trade should work for the common good and promote fair and healthy cooperation. Japan has been an important partner throughout the negotiations, and we hope to announce a set of outcomes soon. Our economies are comprised of more than just numbers. They're comprised of people. So our bilateral relationship is focused on making our trade policies work for our people, not just today, but for years to come. I look forward to continuing to work with Minister Nishimura and other colleagues to write this new story on trade together. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. And now I open the floor to questions. I have one question. While you are thinking about your questions, I have one question already uh, from, our, from our, one of our online viewers. Simon Lester, World Trade Law <laughs> .NET asks, China and Taiwan have both applied to join the CPTPP, of which Japan is a, a party, but the United States is not. Have you discussed the Chinese and Taiwanese applications with your Japanese counterparts? So um, we know the, um, uh, the content of the CPTPP well uh, from our own negotiations uh, back in the day. Uh, and we remain very close with our um, partners uh, who are members of the CPTPP. So uh, yes, um, when we are working on our economic um, uh, relationship and building uh, our economic foundations in this region, uh, we do talk about um, updates with respect to the CPTPP, including new entrants. Mm -hmm. The United States is not on them. On uh, the the United States is not one of them. No. I guess so. So any? Yeah, please. Please uh, come to the microphone and introduce yourself by name and affiliation. And for the moment, keep uh, yourself to one question. Uh, I'm Toshio Ota with uh, Arc Times. Uh, I have just two quick questions. And uh, <laughs> just follow up Can with, uh, with uh, uh, the, the previous question. So you know, the UK has already, uh, the TPP countries already decided the uh, UK to be allowed to join TPP. And, uh, and China and Taiwan has applied for it back in 2021. 20, 2021. And I know you just mentioned that the IPEF uh, efforts, but uh, for the United States, rejoining TPP is still non-starter, given the strategic environment in the region, especially China is, is now applying for TPP. That's one question. One, just one, okay, just one I, I, question. I, I, I ask one, one more question. Another question is about the TikTok. So United States government already uh, uh, prohibited banned uh, federal employee use of the TikTok on official device. And EU and Canada and the UK and New Zealand also uh, uh, inter introduced the same kind of measure. Do you want Japan to do the same for to protect the uh, federal secret, state secret, and, and also do you want Japan to consider a complete ban on TikTok while U U.S. Congress is concealing, debating about it? Okay, um, I get this question a lot, so uh, the first question, so um, I can go ahead and um, uh, take care of this one. Uh, look, um, <clears throat> Uh, we remain close with our partners, as I said before. Uh, we care deeply about this region, and, and is the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework is the U.S. Economic Engagement Program that we are bringing to the Indo-Pacific today. Um, <clears throat> let me say a little bit more about the IPEF, because then I think it answers some of your question um, as you've posed it. Uh, the IPEF is structured across uh, four pillars. Uh, you will know them well. You can look at our, uh, our website for the details. Uh, trade is one of those pillars. But if you, if you look, uh, we're also engaging on supply chains, on decarbonization and infrastructure, and on good governance. 
Um, what you see across the board uh, is a program in the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework that is focused on the particular challenges that we are facing in today's economy. It is um, uh, very apparent, I think, to all of us as professionals, but especially as just ordinary citizens, uh, the kinds of um, fragility that we are facing in our supply chains, uh, from critical supply chains to the ordinary items that we use in daily life uh, that we have seen through the pandemic. Um, we have also seen um, the, uh, um, the increased urgency that we feel today around uh, the climate crisis and the need to uh, forge a path uh, to a clean energy future and to work together on this transition. Um, we also are experiencing the digital transformation every day that goes by, every year that goes by. Not just our economic activity is being transformed, but um, all aspects of our daily life. I'm just looking at um, all of the connected devices that are in the room today. Um, so uh, when I talk to my counterparts right now in a fairly disrupted global economy where there's a lot of anxiety around the changes coming around us, what it means for us in the future, um, and also um, this um, uh, sense of security um, that uh, uh, we are um, uh, grasping for, uh, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework is uh, a demonstration that America is back. We are back in this region to partner with uh, the countries here um, with whom we share um, interests uh, and challenges as well. Uh, so uh, that is to say that uh, what we are doing today is tailored for uh, the challenges and opportunities of today. Um, and um, that is where our focus is. Uh, this work is hard enough in terms of uh, dealing with all of these challenges and uh, working together really to innovate new solutions um, to the changing world order. On uh, TikTok, um, this isn't uh, an area um, that uh, is of um, uh, um, uh, prime uh, USTR jurisdiction. It, it goes across several agencies. So um, let me just say uh, this, which is um, uh, this is a decision for Japan to make. Uh, but certainly, um, I think that um, uh, in our um, relationship with Japan, uh, that uh, with respect to the risks posed by whether it's on privacy, national security, um, that um, um, we would expect that we would have similar uh, interests and viewpoints. Uh, but this is this is something for Japan to decide for itself. Rejoining TPP, mm -hmm. can you? You didn't answer my question in that one. I know. I think I did answer your question my way. <laughs> My name is Nanako Moritani from TBS News. Uh, may, I, may I ask you just one question? Uh, the U.S. government's tax incentive program for consumers purchasing electric vehicles no longer includes Japanese cars among the eligible um, vehicle models. Uh, what is the aim of the decision, and is it intended as a measure against China? Um, so you're talking about the um, uh, incentives for electric vehicles uh, in our Inflation Reduction Act. Um, let me um, put it this way. Um, first of all, it's a very, very large piece of legislation. Um, and um, um, our counterparts, when engaging with us, including on their concerns around this legislation, um, uh, never fail to um, start the conversation by acknowledging that this is an enormous accomplishment on the part of the United States in terms of uh, making an investment in uh, the technologies that are going to be required for the transition to a cleaner, more sustainable future for all of us. Um, <clears throat> Separately, uh, we have heard concerns from our trading partners about how some of these uh, provisions will operate, um, a lot of focus on the electric vehicle uh, provisions. Um, what I would say is um, uh, this, uh, that um, the kinds of transformations that are going to be required to make possible the transition to a more sustainable future um, need to be bold. And um, to view this as um, a first step, first move by the United States, um, it really is meant to be focused on um, the clean energy future 
and as well in these areas, you'll see um, ways that we can work together with our partners uh, to realize the kinds of uh, changes that will be required. Um, there will um, be needed even more innovation and probably more investment as uh, the transition happens. It is really important for us as partners to be able to continue to talk to each other, to raise concerns, and then to figure out how to solve them. More questions? George? My name is Baumgartner. I'm working for Swiss Television. Uh, Mr. Hank Paulson says the situation between the US and China is, is very dangerous. So how far can you go in your sanctions against uh, China without risking a war? And uh, what about uh, reviving WTO before it's too late? Thank you. So um, I think I will agree that um, the relationship between the United States and China, um, let me put it this way, is a really important one uh, for the world economy, but um, even beyond the economic lane where I work uh, for the world. And um, I also recognize, I think, as um, uh, Secretary Paulson does, and probably many of us in, in this room, um, that not just the US-China relationship, but um, many of our country's relationships with China um, uh, are right now quite complex. Um, in fact, um, um, geopolitical tensions are running higher now, I think, than um, uh, we have experienced in uh, most recent years and decades. Um, so uh, I think it is really important for us um, to uh, be uh, deliberate and responsible in our approaches. And I believe um, strongly that the approaches that we have taken um, with respect to um, uh, um, our measures, uh, national security measures with respect to China, uh, are responsible and are um, uh, narrowly targeted. Now, you didn't specify which ones you're talking about, and so uh, um, you know. But I think that uh, what I think you probably are talking about that that is absolutely the case. Um, on uh, the WTO, um, let me just push back on your um, premise. Um, the WTO uh, is um, an extremely important institution. Um, not just for what it does, but also for what it symbolizes. Um, we remain committed to the WTO as strongly as we are committed to the reform of the WTO to better reflect the reality of today's economy. I think that the WTO, when it came into effect now almost 30 years ago, look at all of the changes uh, in our world economy uh, that have happened. So um, I want everybody to know that the WTO just last June uh, produced for the first time in a decade um, a really robust package of negotiated outcomes that were agreed to by 164 member economies. Uh, the WTO continues to be a strong foundation for the multilateral trading system, uh, but um, it can be better, it can be more relevant, and it can be more relevant to uh, our needs today of um, an economic system uh, that um, is more tailored to uh, the needs of our planet, the needs of our people as well. Uh, so I thank you for that question, the opportunity to talk uh, a little bit about the WTO. Hi, uh, my name is Yoshiaki Nohara. I'm a reporter from Bloomberg News. Um, just adding a question to the, the previous question uh, regarding the relationship with China. Uh, you just mentioned that um, you know um, U.S. regulations on China are now already ta targeted, though, but I'm wondering what's your take on how the U.S. is doing to um, in in terms of teaming up with its allies, including Japan, to um, to address concerns regarding China, especially in the areas of semiconductors. Thank you. OK, so let me begin by saying that um, uh, the export controls uh, are outside the purview of USTR's work. Nevertheless, um, we as an administration um, uh, coordinate um, our, uh, our, our positions and our actions. Um, 
let me put it this way, because I'm conscious of um, the fact that you are asking me a very direct question about China, and this is not the first question I'm receiving while I'm here in Tokyo. Um, <clears throat> I think that one of the most important aspects of the work and the program that the United States is bringing, not just to our bilateral relationship with Japan, but also in the region, um, in the Indo-Pacific, Asia-Pacific region, uh, is to focus on where we have shared interests, where we have shared concerns, where we see shared challenges. And I, I, want, to, I want to expand out um, the lens in terms of the types of challenges that we are facing. Uh, certainly, I think that with respect to China, we have um, supply chain challenges. We have geopolitical ten uh, challenges. Uh, there is quite a bit of anxiety, uh, and that does form a basis for the collaborative work that we do here. But uh, just as much, I'll go back to my um, initial identification of uh, the types of challenges that we are facing in today's uh, world economy, just as much as the, um, uh, the climate crisis, <laughs> Um, the uh, digital transformations of our societies, and also the widening inequalities that we are seeing in our own economies, but also across the world economy. So that is to say that um, uh, our plates are quite full in terms of the explorations that we are doing around uh, shared challenges, shared interests, and the development of a shared vision for um, a regional and also world economy that can support uh, thriving economies like ours and a prosperity that is more broadly shared. Okay. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Kiyoshi Takenaka from Reuters. Thank you for uh, the opportunity, Ambassador. Um, one simple question. Uh, the U.S. has reached an uh, agreement with Japan on critical minerals uh, fairly quickly. Uh, it is taking a bit more time, uh, longer, uh, to reach an agreement with uh, EU. Uh, could you let us know why? And uh, uh, how soon do you think uh, the agreement with you can be reached? Thank you. Thank you. So I think that we began our conversations with Japan um, as uh, at the beginning of the year. Um, and so I think it took, I didn't count, but I think somewhere between two and three months. Uh, we've just started our conversations with the EU. So I think it is technically not accurate to say that the EU exercise is taking longer. Uh, so let me just uh, put that in context. Um, but uh, um, all of our negotiations, in order to be meaningful, in order for us to um, really be appropriately engaged, uh, have to be tailored to that particular relationship and that particular trading partner. The EU is quite a different trading partner than Japan. First, it's a collection of 27 countries, <laughs> which is quite complex. Uh, so let me just leave that there and say, um, uh, we'll see how long it takes. Uh, but um, uh, it is um, a negotiation on the same subject matter. Uh, perhaps with the same perspective on the types of solutions we're trying to accomplish, um, but it is a different negotiation. So, short follow-up then, uh, why did Japan start earlier? Um, or why did the negotiations with Japan started earlier? That is a good question, and I actually don't have an answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> it, it just did. <laughs> Hi, uh, Takaki Tobinaga from Kyoto News, and I have a question about the IPEF. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, among the four pillars, is there any particular area um, negotiations are advanced than others, and any area uh, facing more difficulties? Mm -hmm. And uh, do you think um, early harvest is a possibility in some areas? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. That's a great question. So I'll review a little bit um, where we are in the process. Um, at the end of last May, um, our leaders launched uh, this framework work. 
Um, in September, uh, Secretary Raimondo and I hosted um, IPEF ministers uh, at uh, our first in-person ministerial in Los Angeles. Um, so that was just a little over six months ago. Since then, we've already had two rounds of negotiations, uh, one in Australia and uh, one um, just last month in um, Indonesia. Uh, there will be a third round of negotiations um, uh, very soon. I think we've announced this in Singapore in a couple weeks. Uh, so that's moving at a very quick pace. Um, <clears throat> I think that we'll need to see how the conversations go in Singapore to be able to assess a little bit what you're looking for, which is um, uh, what the status of progress is. But let me just make a blanket statement, which is um, we have uh, a lot of momentum around uh, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework negotiations. You're right, each one of the pillars is quite different from the other, um, although you know, all on a, a spectrum of um, uh, economic-related engagement uh, that we are doing in the region. Um, and uh, I'm not a betting person, I don't have a crystal ball, so I don't know uh, where we will land exactly and at what pace, but uh, it is absolutely in the spirit of the IPEF to be able to demonstrate that we can deliver real outcomes uh, as we go and not have to wait um, you know, uh, several years um, to realize an outcome. So uh, I'm very optimistic uh, that you will see uh, results um, soon and uh, maybe even over the course of this year. Hello, um, this is Yang Zhu with the Wall Street Journal. Um, thanks for taking my question. So um, I'm wondering how much of contact the USTR has with China these days, and do you have any plan to visit the country anytime soon? Thanks. Thank you. Um, well, we do have contact. Um, uh, I don't quite know how to quantify it for you. Um, we uh, uh, do continue to do um, the regular business of our trade work, uh, and that is uh, being in touch with our trading partners. Um, China's is a very significant trading partner. Uh, in terms of my own plans, uh, I do not, as of today, uh, have plans to go to China. Uh, but I have been, um, throughout my time as USTR, uh, been uh, completely open uh, and um, um, uh, to engaging with my counterparts in Beijing. Okay, please. Can you? Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Masako Zaki from Kyoto News, also with my colleague. Um, I just wanted to go back on the uh, topic about the Indo-Pacific uh, Economic Framework. You mentioned er earlier that you know we could be seeing something, you were hopeful to see something by the end of this year. And I wanted to uh, ask your take on, is it possible for a partial agreement among the, uh, you know, not just one pillar, but just a partial from one, from one of the pillars? Certainly. Um, so um, this is a very interesting part of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which is um, we're facing uh, what we today in 2023 would call our 21st century challenges and opportunities. And I've described the types of challenges and opportunities we're, we're looking at now. Um, <clears throat> the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework uh, is not a traditional free trade agreement negotiation. Uh, we are negotiating rules, we are negotiating documents, we are negotiating ideas and concepts, and uh, building um, a consensus and agreement across these areas. Uh, but I just want to be clear that um, some of the um, framework assumptions that we have with a traditional FTA negotiation, uh, some of them are applicable here. We are negotiating things. We are looking for outcomes and agreements. Um, <clears throat> but this is not the traditional FTA. So um, uh, there are different components. They will move at different paces. Uh, and we will also t look to uh, build on, even in areas where we have an agreement, say, this year, um, if you look at the areas that we are addressing, whether it's supply chains, whether it's digital um, or decarbonization, um, these are um, uh, some of the, the biggest challenges that we are facing today. And I think that um, it is very much in our vision that the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework will give us a continuing community and forum to uh, work through these issues as our own governments continue to evolve their approaches and develop solutions uh, to the types of challenges that we're facing. OK, 
Okay. Toshio Ota from Arc Times again. So, uh, thank you very much for the pres uh, press, conference, press conference, Madam uh, Representative. I have one quick question on China. So you, also, you mentioned that the geopolitical uh, challenges has posed in this region. And the uh, United States started uh, some semi semiconductor export restriction to China, and Japan is uh, helping the effort too. So many experts in, in, in Washington and also in Japan is seeing this as a sign of the United States is trying to decouple China out of the world economy. Is the U.S. Biden administration trying to decouple China from the rest of the world economy and also U U.S. want Japan to join the wagon? So we want the Japan to join the wagon. Join the efforts to, oh, yeah. to decouple China out of the yeah. world economy? Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think that um, uh, those of us in the Biden administration who have been asked this particular question about uh, is it your intention to decouple, uh, that in um, all of our different policy areas, reflecting our different personalities, um, have all been very clear that that is not the intention uh, to decouple. I think one of the challenges is um, what are we talking about with respect to decoupling? And from my perspective, if, uh, if the goal is to hive off the U.S. and the Chinese economies from each other, uh, that is neither the goal, nor do I think it is um, uh, really achievable. Um, uh, China has a very, very large uh, footprint in uh, global trade and economics. The challenge for us is to figure out how to level the playing field in, in trade speak, uh, how to identify the challenges that we are facing with respect to that enormous footprint uh, that China has and um, China's particular set of uh, economic policies and practices and to figure out how we can um, uh, defend ourselves, defend our opportunities to continue to uh, compete and to thrive, to grow our economies uh, given a set of policies that... Um, um, uh, have put a lot of pressure on our market-based systems. Um, so that's how I look at it, certainly from the seat as the trade representative. Um, and uh, this is an issue where the particular um, challenges and impacts that we feel as an economy um, are not unique. And it is an area of uh, collaboration that we are undertaking with our partners who have systems similar to ours, who are uh, experiencing the impacts of competition with China in similar ways. And I think that the goal is <clears throat> about ourselves uh, how to continue to create the space for our economies to thrive and to adapt to the kinds of competitive pressures that we see. Uh, uh, yeah, please. My name is Yoshio Hota. I'm a freelance journalist. Thank you for coming to the, to the club to this, this morning. I have one simple question. USTR recently uh, pursued uh, and asked China uh, not to uh, take the uh, FTA yeah, because the United States government re realized that simply reducing tariff it doesn't function uh, to solve many uh, uh, trade issues. So simply uh, don't pursue FTA. Could you tell me the, the philosophy the behind of this? So you mean um, across the board, we're currently not negotiating uh, traditional free trade agreements. Okay, all right. But it doesn't have to do with um, uh, negotiations with China. Correct, okay, all right, I uh, understand your question. Um, yes, so um, uh, let me find a way to uh, put this succinctly uh, for this particular audience. Um, the traditional free trade agreement <clears throat> means different things to different people. Uh, one of the things that it does is symbolize um, between um, the parties a desire to um, uh, enhance their economic relationship with each other. Um, I'll just put it to everybody here. Um, that is most commonly associated with the FTA negotiation exercise. But the FTA negotiation is not the only way 
to symbolize the desire to work more closely together and to align your economies more closely together. And that's the first point I want to make, which is the Indo-Pacific economic framework, the way that we have structured it, um, the partnership that we have with Japan in ensuring a diversity, diversity in the partners in terms of size of economies, levels of uh, development um, uh, uh, regionally, uh, from very, very large uh, economies like the United States and India to very small ones like Fiji, um, is um, um, uh, at the top level a strong signal that the United States is here, the United States is back in the region, and the United States is coming with an economic program of engagement to work towards uh, a beneficial outcomes for all of us through this collaboration. On the specifics on the free trade agreement traditionally, um, <clears throat> you, uh, if you're talking to the trade nerds and uh, the technical experts, <clears throat> you're going to get into what's inside of uh, the free trade agreement, what goes beyond just the symbolism and the signification of the exercise, but to um, how, the, how the instrument works. And um, our traditional free trade agreements, and I think this is fairly reflective uh, across the world, the practice has been um, a uh, maximally, pretty aggressively, as we've exercised in the past, <clears throat> trade liberalizing program. And that was built on the assumption that the more liberalization in trade, the more trade that you could um, uh, create between countries, the more prosperity there would be, and the more peace there would be. On the prosperity point, I'll just point out that while we have seen a lot of prosperity created in the world in these last several decades, we are nevertheless seeing a growing inequality around the world, as between countries and also within our own economies. And so for us, there is a need to revisit the traditional structure in pursuit of better, more inclusive outcomes. <clears throat> Uh, the second piece of this is in that um, uh, maximally liberalizing model, the incentives that we have given to the economic actors uh, in the world is to pursue cost efficiency, to make their decisions in terms of um, where they source, where they invest, how they produce, who they uh, have uh, producing for them, to cut costs. In that world where the incentives are to pursue efficiency above all else, that has brought us to the kind of supply chains that we see around the world today, which are sometimes extremely complex and far-flung, and also supply chains that reflect um, high risk in terms of concentrations of where things are supplied and produced. So in this area, we are also looking for better outcomes. We are looking for a way to do trade with our partners that will lead to incentives that create more resilient supply chains so that we have the actors in the world economy solving for not just efficiency only, but solving also for resiliency, and at the same time, solving for sustainability too, because we all need that long runway into the future to be able to have hope to provide for futures for our children and their children. So that's the reason why the traditional free trade agreement is not something that we are negotiating right now, which is we are facing a number of challenges today that we do not see this as the tool for solving. And that doesn't mean we throw everything out. If you look at the scope of the trade pillar in the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, you'll see many elements of a traditional uh, trade negotiation that are incorporated in. But everything that's scoped into the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework is there because it answers yes to the question, will collaboration negotiation on this topic promote resilience or sustainability or inclusiveness? And each of the components in our negotiation has answered yes to one, two, or all three of those questions.
Thank you for taking my question. Uh, my name is Maki Iwasaki from GD Press. Uh, I have some follow-up question. Uh, some people in Japanese and German automobile companies criticized the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act and the recent tax benefits of the purchase of only American car. They said it is uh, protectionism. How do you evaluate these comments? Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I generally don't like to use the term protectionism uh, because I think it creates a false dichotomy that there are certain things that are, are protectionist, and then I think on the other side it's um, free trade, right? <clears throat> uh, so that assumes that there are only these two categories, something that is protectionist and something that is free trade. In fact, if you look at the policies around the world, there is much more of a spectrum. If you look at the Inflation Reduction Act, it does have and reflect a much more open embrace by the United States today of the idea of an industrial policy. But it reflects also a very specific American approach to industrial policy, which is not a planned economy, but how you can use more tools to create the incentives in the marketplace to create the outcomes that you want. And in the case of the Inflation Reduction Act, um, uh, more innovation and adaptation to clean energy technologies. In the traditional conversation around industrial policy, <clears throat> it has been closely um, associated with this concept of protectionism, that you only advance industrial policy to benefit yourself. Well, I think that even if you're looking at the electric vehicle provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act. You see baked into it this acknowledgment that it is not just for the United States, that uh, in terms of uh, it, it reflects a recognition that uh, there are supply chains that involve um, the collaboration of uh, multiple countries and economies. And so that's why we have negotiated the Critical Minerals Agreement uh, with Japan. Uh, to bring in <clears throat> parts of the Japanese uh, electric vehicle battery supply chain uh, into these benefits. And ultimately, what I really want to drive home is um, the reason why this is not, um, as you describe it, all for us, is that we recognize that um, in order to realize uh, that clean energy future that I think all of us want, it is something that we are going to need to do with others. Okay, I also have a follow-up question myself about the IPEF. Um, you mentioned uh, that you are hopeful to see some concrete results quite soon, and if, if I remember correctly, you mentioned also for the workers and for the companies. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder what's in for the countries here in the region. At the G7 foreign ministers meeting, Anthony Blinken said that basically two-thirds of the time of the negotiation, of the discussions, were spent on the global south and related questions. Asian, ASEAN centrality was specifically mentioned uh, in the communique. Uh, IPEF is focused on the Indo-Pacific region and ASEAN. So what actually are you offering these countries that are of course, they want to be part of uh, more resilient supply chains, but for them also market access, the, the traditional market access is also very important. So what are, are you offering these countries in terms of market access, especially uh, yeah, if you want to convince them to be part of the American resilient supply chain and not on the Chinese uh, resilient supply chain? So thank you so much for that question, Martin, because I think it reflects a very traditional approach to trade negotiations that we encounter quite often right now. Right now is a time where innovation and trade policy is um, not just badly needed, but necessary for us to be able to break through um, the world economy as it is and to build towards a world economy in a positive vision that um, more closely resembles the one that we want. Um, <clears throat> we in the United States uh, are very focused on uh, greater sustainability 
in the way that uh, we do trade and in the results that we have from trade. And that's why you see such a focus on, for example, uh, the elimination of forced labor in global supply chains. I think that it, this example does a very clear job of demonstrating our value proposition, which is that prosperity for the world, whether you are in an advanced economy or a developing economy, a middle-income economy, or a least developed economy, that your path to development and growth and a bright future uh, should not be premised on the exploitation of your fellow human beings and your fellow workers. So uh, in terms of what's in it for uh, our partners, it is to bring them along with us to work towards a vision of, frankly, a better version of globalization, one where our interconnected economic activity can be driving higher standards rather than lower standards. And that applies both on the, on the, um, uh, the human rights, the worker rights uh, perspective, and also with respect to the environmental. Okay. I was told uh, that the ambassador has to leave a bit earlier, so there's uh, uh, time for one last question. Is there any questions from the floor? Okay. Uh, Yoshio Murakami is my name, freelance now. I think the Kishida government has just decided to come up with a huge defense expenditure. Mm -hmm. And the large amount of that money is going to be spent to purchase American military equipment as exemplified by the first order already of the missile. The, I do realize that has nothing to do with your work with the trade. But my question, therefore, is does it make you feel that you want to be nice to Japan in your negotiation because we are spending so much money on that for your country? Or you feel like you want to be more competitive with the military side mm -hmm. and get much as much as I can to show them that I can get that much more from Japan? So, inside of a trade negotiation room, you'll see um, the deployment of uh, many different uh, approaches. Uh, and I think that uh, regardless of these dynamics, um, we've had a longstanding relationship with Japan on trade. Um, the Japanese uh, trade negotiators are really tough. And so yes, sometimes we want to be nice to them. But also, most of the time, we have to be tough right back. And uh, I think that that's uh, really part of the uh, trade negotiations culture, uh, separate from this, this overall. But because you mentioned Prime Minister Kishida, it gives me an opportunity also to say that in terms of the, um, the shared values and the shared vision that we are uh, working towards through the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, uh, I am really um, appreciative of um, the Japanese government's uh, leadership and partnership in the um, architecture of the IPEF and in uh, uh, motivating progress in the IPEF. And I'll uh, just say that um, in terms of listening to Prime Minister Kishida speak, um, because I listened very closely also to my own boss, President Biden, uh, one point of um, real uh, convergence that is really relevant to the IPEF exercise is when I hear Prime Minister Kishida talk about the need for a new capitalism here in Japan, and when I hear President Biden talk about his vision for the American economy being one that grows the economy from the bottom up and the middle out, I think that goes precisely to the desire that we share, not just between our two governments, but at, at widely within the region and also around the world for prosperity that we create that can be more inclusive. And that is a, a hugely important guiding principle of the IPEF. We have time for one last question, I was told. So any other questions? Otherwise, I have one. Um, and uh, this time it's about uh, the new global order and um, basically um, the outcome you want uh, by the new kind of industrial policy in the United States, industrial policy in the United States. Looking at it from a European and some Asian perspective, 
It seems, yes, uh, there is an, uh, the will to redefine uh, industrial policy. There is a will to redefine supply chains, but with a very US-centered um, yeah, with a very US-centered uh, um, direction. Um, there are complaints, especially on the semiconductor side, that uh, the IRA, if you want to get some uh, sub uh, subsidies, you have to, it restricts companies' investment in other countries, for example. Um, so how do you deal with these issues with your partners, with your strong partners that you want, that are investing billions of dollars in the United States? and um, that are now facing restrictions on their own business and uh, have to think whether they want to apply for, supply, uh, for subsidies or not. So um, I've tried to get at this in my earlier answer, but this gives me an opportunity to be more clear. And I've spoken about this um, uh, quite a bit recently, which is um, our vision for an industrial policy is really um, out of a, um, a, it's a, it's a corrective measure. It does reflect that uh, there's a correction that needs to be made, for instance, in um, uh, clean energy technology, that there needs to be an infusion of um, um, uh, energy, if you will, uh, incentive uh, to um, uh, create the innovations that are going to be required. But in other areas, we as the United States have experienced deindustrialization over the past several decades in, in several areas. Um, you will also see some of our policies go to that correction of reinvigorating in certain uh, areas. What I would say is this in very clear terms. Um, our industrial policy is one that has to work with trade policy. So uh, our vision is for an industrial policy that is collaborative, that can be complementary, where we can be talking to each other about the kinds of um, uh, um, investments that need to be made uh, and uh, how we can ensure that um, we're deconflicting. Uh, we're not all trying to uh, reinvent the wheel at the same time. And this is something that's quite relevant in the conversations between the US and the EU, for instance, uh, where we both have our own CHIPS acts. Um, and I, I guess I, I, I will uh, not resist the temptation to say that um, um, for many of the countries who have um, practiced uh, industrial policies in the past and even in the present, that complementary piece, that piece that works with trade policy, is not always present there. And so I do want to draw attention to the fact that as we correct for imbalances, um, uh, places where uh, markets have uh, fallen down, um, we are doing it uh, with a vision that um, the world and our partners have to come with us. Thank you very much. I think this was the closing statement. And as it is common, we also have prepared a one-year honorary membership. So oh. next time you are here in Tokyo, you can you are a member and you can join us at the bar. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Most important. That's a tangible benefit. Thank you. Thank you.